MCC. Glad to see you guys this morning. We're going to sort of get our minds on the right subject this morning. Let's see. Lift your heads. Here we go. Lift your hand, weary sinner. The river's just a hill. Down the path of forgiveness, salvation. Let the gates of glory open wide. All who strayed, all who strayed and walked away, unspeakable things you've done. Fix your eyes on the mountain, let the past be dead and gone. Gates of glory open wide if you're lost and wrecked again. Come stumbling in like a prodigal child. See the world start crumbling. Let the gates of glory open wide. Let the chains fall. Let the chains fall. Let the chains fall. Let the chains fall. Let the chains, the chains, the chains, the chains, the chains. If you're lost and wandering, come stumbling in like a prodigal child. Let the walls start crumbling. Let the gates of glory open wide. If you're lost and wrecked again. Let the gates of glory open wide. Let the gates of glory open wide. Go ahead, round of applause, round of applause for us. How's everybody doing? As you may know, it's Easter coming up. I don't know if anything signs around that are going to give you give that away. But uh, we do have our Easter egg hunt coming up later. We're super excited about that. Um, you see those little pieces of the paper that are on the chair. That's for your kids, and when you're signing up, um, or have someone after service picking them up. That's just a raffle for the Easter egg hunt after. So fill those out, one per kid, as you're walking out. We appreciate that. Um, before I go on the rest of my announcements, I did want to make an apology. Um, I know we live in a world where sometimes you can post things online that can be taken wrong. It can bring some some hate or some debate um, to each other. So I made this a few weeks ago. It would be in the Easter season. Um, so just wanted to apologize to those I offended. I had a picture of black jelly beans on my face. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, who's, who's my black jelly bean people? Make some noise. Yeah. Thank you. Be sure to pray for those people around you who are not making noise for the black jelly beans. Um, so I do apologize for anybody who took offense to the black jelly beans that I had put on Facebook. Um, but a couple other things do coming up. Like I said, next week is Easter. We're super excited about that. Um, as we open our doors, it's one of the most um, common times you're going to have people who are new to the church or maybe coming back to the church. So we got three services coming up next week, 8.30, 10 o'clock, and 11.30. Um, for you online, um, it's going to be not this time next week, but 10 o'clock is going to be our online service. So hope to see you guys there. Be sure to keep inviting your friends, family, coworkers um, as we celebrate this remarkable story of the death and resurrection of Jesus. Um, the following week after that, we are going to have our legacy planning class. It's going to be up in 220 after our second service, where um, I know from experience, um, having experienced a death in the family and then finding out that my dad was one of the 70% who don't have a plan 
after uh, death of where the you know, next steps and all that. So really encourage you to attend there. You can set up you know, your will and, test, or will and testament, will and trust, um, and different ways of where, what's going to happen with your stuff as you leave this earth. Because unfortunately, unlike Jesus, you're not going to be coming back to tell us uh, what to do with that. So uh, we want to encourage you to attend that class next week so we know what's going to happen with your stuff when you make your way to heaven. So we thank you. Thanks for being here. Continue standing. Continue worshiping us as we celebrate and enter into Holy Week. Thanks, guys. Amen. Thank you, brother. All right, we're going to continue in our worship this morning, sing about our Lamb of God, sing of, of Jesus this morning. So you join with us. introduce myself. My name is Josh. Um, worship leader here. And uh, we're glad to get to worship with you guys this morning. I wanted to take some time this morning before we keep singing to um, just spend some time talking to God. Um, I, I don't know uh, 
what the world like looks like from your perspective, but this week has been uh, just a, a really negative, um, man, if you look at social media, just a negative place to be right now. Um, and again, I don't, I don't know. Maybe, maybe you had the most awesome week ever, and praise God for that if you did. Uh, my, my family and I uh, moved several years ago. We lived in Nashville, Tennessee for 10 years. And so, uh, as you can imagine, Facebook uh, is a very interesting place with all our, our Nashville friends talking about uh, the shooting that happened in a school down in Nashville this past week. And that's just one of, you know, pick any one of uh, many current events that just you get to see the, the ugly side of the world, right? And what a, um, man, a frustrating place it can be. And there's, you know, we could, we could do, we could have lots of debates and conversations, and that's mostly what you see in the world right now as who's to blame and what's to blame and how to fix it and whose fault it is. And um, I think for our perspective, uh, I think where I, I like to land on that or where just the gospel shows me to land is that the real story is that somebody that God loves and created and Jesus died for got so far down the wrong path on something that did something terrible to a bunch of people that God loves and created and Jesus died for. And that's the real story. God loves us. He made each and every one of us, and he wants so badly to have a relationship with each one of us. And we get so tangled up in so many different things in life. And there's so many ways that life can, uh, you know, we can, we can run far afield from, from what God intended. Um, but when we come to pray, we have the opportunity to, to uh, interact and, and, and sort of speak on behalf of those people, pray for those people. And that's just, like I said, one of many things that we can pray about. And, and as soon as you start talking about something like that, right, faces pop into your head of people that you know that are going through hard times. Maybe it's you, your family, um, friends, coworkers, uh, schoolmates. There may be lots of, uh, there's always the potential for things going sort of sideways in life. And so I just felt like we pray every week. We, we sing songs to God every week. We hear a message from the word every week. Um, but there are some times that we want to just stop and take a little bit more of a moment to go, man, there's so many things that we could mention. Let's just take time together to do that. All right. So I'm going to pray and uh, let's just talk to God this morning. <clears throat> Father, I, I, when I thought about taking time this morning to pray, I, I I didn't really know what it was that I wanted to say. Um, but I guess the, the tendency, and, and I can only speak for myself, my tendency is to pray when something's going wrong and to talk about that thing that's going wrong and ask for your help with the thing that's going wrong and to start there and to camp there and, and, and worry about how you can fix what's, what's wrong in my life. don't always think to start with recognizing how amazing it is that the creator of the universe wants to hear the sound of my voice talking to him. And so, one, I want to start there by saying, God, you're amazing. You created everything. Everything that we see, everything that we know, everything that we are is because of you and from you. And God, you are amazing. And if we've sang that and not realized it or sang it and prayed it and not meant it, God, I can say for me, this morning I ask your forgiveness. And we take time this morning to say we're sorry that we have in our lives and in our gathering together as the church here, that we have not fully acknowledged what you've done in our lives, but come to you and just with our requests first. But God, there is so much going on in the world and you, you can look to the headlines nationally, internationally, in our own community. But God, you don't have to leave this room to, to see that there are things, there are struggles, there are sicknesses, there are diseases, there are uh, marriage struggles and family struggles. We're, we're trying to raise kids right. We're trying to um, work out problems at work and work out problems with, with our friends. And the world can be just an oppressively heavy place if we only ever look around and don't look up. And so God, this morning we recognize that we get to talk to you. We get to 
ask you for help and we get to realize once again that if we only ever live life trying to handle things and manage the chaos by our own strength, by our own wisdom, by our own power, we are doomed to fail. But our Heavenly Father, you are right here with us, wanting relationship with us, waiting, maybe not even to solve the problem. There might not be the resolution for every situation like we want. And we talked about last week that even if you don't fix all our problems, what will we do? But God, we choose to come into this place again and to live our lives the rest of this week acknowledging your greatness and your glory and living our lives seeking to be more like Jesus, seeking to be a disciple of his to concern ourselves more with honoring you in the world and honoring you with our lives and what our lives look like and the things we choose to prioritize for you than about our success or our great happiness or the accumulation of of things or or of good times or of, of just ease of living. But God, there are times like this where there are suffering, there is hurt, there is death happening, there is struggles of all kinds and when they come close to us we're forced to realize once again how fragile life is how temporary it is how sad that it has to come to that for us to remember that we're only here for a short time there's something so much bigger in the story than our little chapter but God still you love us Still you seek us. Still you want us. We're humbled by that. And so this morning as we sing songs and as we come and listen to your word once again, we pray that you hear clearly from us that even when we are struggling, even when we don't eat, we come in here and sometimes we're not ready to believe it again. We're not even sure. Maybe we might be kicking the tires. There's those of us who are, who are new that are not even sure. Can I even believe this? I think I see a glimmer of hope and I think I've seen you at work and I think maybe this was you. So I'm going to sing the songs and I'm going to put my hope in that you are the God that you say you are. And that so many have testified about and so many have proclaimed your great works, your great love, your great wisdom. So we're going to rest and hold on to that in these times that can be so dark. We're going to hold on to hope. You have us. And so, God, we sing as people who have hope. Not maybe that every situation will go exactly as we thought, but there will be a day when all those hard times will be no more. And so, God, we sing with hope this morning. We sing acknowledging that we believe. We choose you again and again and again. We love you, God. It's in Jesus' name we pray.
this is your first time with us. My name is Mike. I'm the lead pastor here at MCC, and I really appreciate you being with us. Uh, and a spa- special shout out uh, to Jim and Judy who are watching at home uh, as Judy recuperates. And so thanks for joining us there. Uh, and thank you for letting us know that you'll be joining us online this morning. I appreciate hearing that. Hey, we're in this series. Uh, we've been in a series that we're calling Just Like Us, and we're looking at people in Scripture to see how Uh, Our stories and their stories are incredibly similar, and next week we're going to see what Easter tells us about how we're just like Jesus, and so I hope you'll join us for that. Uh, And if you've missed any of those, you can catch up uh, at our website with those messages. You might be surprised at how similar you are to people that you'll be glad to be compared to and others that maybe, you know, you're not. that. And, And honestly, today, listen, today of all the people that we're looking at, Today, for me, is the most difficult. Uh, uh, Today, we're going to look at a person who becomes disillusioned, and we're going to see what happens, how that happens, and then what happens when you become disillusioned uh, with someone or or something. Uh, Today, we're going to look at a person uh, uh, that, that helps us understand that we've probably faced this in our life, that awful feeling of being disillusioned, and sometimes it has to do with a relationship. Maybe you've been disillusioned uh, with a teacher at school or a friend or someone that you're dating or that you're married to, or maybe it's a parent-child relationship, but disillusionment can take many forms when it comes to relationships, or maybe circumstances have left you disillusioned. Uh, You thought finally getting out of school was going to be a blast. I mean, you're going to make new friends, you were going to have all this money, there was this whole new world, and you're looking around going, where's the money? Uh, Where's the new world, right? Uh, or you went on vacation. Maybe the circumstance was you went on vacation and it rained every day. Or you retired from your job and, and you're just really looking forward to it. But now there's this sense of there's maybe a little lack of purpose because what you used to get up for, you don't. You don't know what you're going to be getting up for at this point. Or maybe you're disillusioned with the church. You know, we know that church attendance across the country has been declining long before COVID hit. But boy, COVID was a throat punch uh, to attendance, and many churches closed their doors during COVID. Many have never gotten back to their pre-COVID attendance. We're incredibly grateful that we have, but what's been happening, because it, it happens here as well, maybe you thought there wouldn't be any problems in the church, and then you heard somebody that you know goes here say something you never thought you would hear a church person say. And quite frankly, it's just kind of tainted your view of the whole church. Or, or maybe you thought the preacher would have the biblical knowledge of Billy Graham and the servanthood of Mother Teresa, the boldness of the Apostle Paul, and, and then you met me. And, uh, <laughs> or maybe you became a Christian thinking life would get easier, and it didn't. Actually, it may have become more difficult because you're following Jesus. Or you pray and you pray and your prayers seem to be like words hitting the ceiling and falling back to the floor. You know, disillusionment uh, surfaces, which explains why many people move from job to job or relationship to relationship or church to church or just out of church altogether. And this morning, we're going to look at a disciple who became disillusioned. In fact, his disenchantment centered around the most important relationship of all. It was his relationship with Jesus, and this is one of those people that we really don't want to be like. But the reality is that just like Judas, you and I can become disillusioned by Jesus. We're going to see what caused it because that might be a path that some of us are even on right now or some of our friends or family members are on. We want to be able to identify that. Uh, so if you have your Bibles with you, Luke 22 is where we're going to be. If you have the Bible app, the YouVersion Bible app on your uh, device, uh, you'll find our notes there. But we're going to be in Luke chapter 22, so check this out, beginning in verse 1. Now the festival of unleavened bread called the Passover was approaching, and the chief priests and the teachers of the law were looking for some way to get rid of Jesus, but they were afraid of the people. Then Satan entered Judas, called Iscariot, one of the twelve, and Judas went to the chief priests and the officers of the temple guard and discussed with them how he might betray Jesus. And they were delighted 
They agreed to give him money. He consented and he watched for an opportunity to hand Jesus over to them when no crowd was present. Now, uh, to get a setting for this, uh, two Jewish celebrations are mentioned in the beginning of our verses. Passover was this annual remind, reminder, remembering, actually a retelling, if they could. Uh, it was supposed to be a reliving uh, of the night uh, that God freed the Israelites from slavery in Egypt when God passed over the houses that had the blood of the lamb on their door. Uh, the day of Passover was followed by a seven-day festival called the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which was also a retelling of the same event from a different angle. It was a reminder that the Israelites left Egypt so fast that they didn't have time for their bread to rise, and so they made unleavened bread. So it was called the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Uh, by Jesus' time, the whole week was called Passover. All Jewish males 12 years and older uh, were required to go to Jerusalem to celebrate. So all of the Jews uh, from all over the Roman Empire would converge on Jerusalem to celebrate one of the most important events in the history of their nation. And so it seemed obvious that Jesus and his followers were going to be in town as well. And if you look at verse 2, this was good news for the religious leaders because they were trying to figure out how to kill him, how to kill Jesus. But they feared a riot because the people loved Jesus. Uh, so for them, it would have been last week. For us, it's today, right? Today is the day that Jesus, you know, 2,000 years ago would have come riding into Jerusalem on a donkey. We, we call today, when we think about that day, we call it Palm Sunday. Just wondering. All right, just checking. Uh, and I don't know if you can see the pieces of this story coming together because Jesus is coming to Jerusalem. The religious leaders are looking for some way that they might be able to eliminate him, but they need this inside person on the job. Verse 3. We find the other piece of the puzzle. We all know his name. Now, the name, when we say it out loud today, it brings all kinds of negative connotations, doesn't it? Uh, nobody names their child after Judas anymore. As a matter of fact, when the 12 are listed, uh, his name always comes last. Peter is always first, Judas is always last, and it always has this qualifier, who became a traitor or who betrayed Jesus. As a matter of fact, when John in his gospel talks about them, says that Judas was a thief and would steal money from Jesus uh, and the 12 that they lived on, all we remember about him on this side of the story is that he was a scoundrel. But it wasn't always that way. In Aramaic, Ishkariot means men of Kiriath. He was born and raised in the territory where David would hone his skills to become the greatest shepherd of the nation of Israel. His father, Simon Iscariot, had earned fame as a freedom fighter under the previous regime. And just the name Judas, I mean, it just exuded heroism to the Jewish nation. One, com one commentator said, Judah or Judas was the name of one of the 12 sons of Jacob in the Old Testament. And the uprising for independence that would have happened 164 years before Jesus was born was led by a man named Judas, Judas Maccabeus, who, would, who was looked upon by the Jewish nation as kind of the way we look at George Washington in our country today. You know, I mentioned a moment ago that Ishkariot meant men of Kirioth. There's actually a little bit more behind that name. In the book of Acts, we read that it refers to a Sicarios, which was a radical freedom fighter, and they would carry a blade uh, in a dagger that uh, would be in their tunic that nobody would see, and they thought nothing of assassinating Romans or anyone who collaborated with Rome, Rome for that matter. Whether or not Judas was one of those extremists, we don't know, but what we do know is heritage suggests that he was looking for a Messiah who would secure freedom for Israel from Rome. So, as a son of the tribe of Judah, raised in the heart of Judea, bearing the honored name of Judas, could there be any more loyal person in all of Israel? Jesus hand-selected working-class men who did little to conceal their flaws. All 11 of them, the other 11, were from Galilee, as far as we know. Judas was the only selection that actually would have made sense to the people in his day. He saw Jesus calm the storm. He saw Jesus raise the dead. He was with Jesus when he made the lame walk. But I want to make sure you catch this. It's in the notes being in the right place without the right heart leads to frustration. You, you can even be in church. You, you can sing the songs, but if your heart isn't right with God, it's just going to lead to frustration. So what happened? Because here's the thing. 
I don't want to be disillusioned, just like Judas. So this morning, we're going to see uh, that that didn't change, that didn't happen overnight with Judas, and it doesn't today with people either. So the first step, because there are steps into it, the first step toward disillusionment is disappointment, which isn't a big step, right? We've all been disappointed before, and the Scriptures don't tell us why Judas uh, was disappointed, but they do give us enough information to draw some conclusions. Most likely, he was disappointed with unmet expectations. Jesus did not fulfill the plans that Judas, and quite frankly, the, the other 11, so the 12, none of the 12 were expecting Jesus to do what he did in the way he did it. They wanted a hostile takeover. But Judas specifically was disappointed in at least two ways. He thought Jesus had the wrong agenda. Again, all of them misunderstood his agenda. They all thought he was leading a revolution uh, to set up a military or a political kingdom. As a matter of fact, if you remember, if you know the Gospels, James and John, two of the 12, they asked to sit at Jesus' right and left hand in his new kingdom, places of authority and power in his new kingdom. But Judas responded differently than the others. Judas probably felt that Jesus was also with the wrong people. From his perspective, if Jesus really was the Messiah, if he really was going to lead this uprising against Rome, instead of spending just some of his time with the most influential and powerful political leaders, the movers and the shakers, he should be spending all of his time with them. But Jesus seemed to be ticking off all the religious leaders, and he was hanging out with handicapped people and, and the hurting people and peasants, not wealthy people. And I wonder... Because it seems that it's possible that today there are some who are here with us in the room, who are with us online, and you won't be here next year because Jesus isn't making it happen in your life the way you think it should, he should, in the time that you think he should. And the, the things you're asking from him, you're not necessarily getting yes from him. And when you and I become disappointed... We need to watch because our next step will be to distance ourselves or to disconnect. You know, when John records the Last Supper, he has a detail that the other three Gospels don't. He says, as soon as Judas had taken the bread, he went out and it was night. Separated himself from the other apostles. You know, I mentioned a moment ago that the 12 apostles and Jesus uh, himself were all from Galilee. Judas was the only one who was not from Galilee. Do you wonder if you ever felt like an outsider with all of those guys? Uh, he'd always struggled with being different. We don't know, but what we do know is after the betrayal, he became an enemy spy, became a spy in the enemy's camp. And a spy in the enemy's camp cannot afford friendships in that camp. So he distanced himself from the others and ultimately from God himself. Last week, we looked at this passage from Hebrews chapter 2 that says, we must pay more careful attention, therefore, to what we've heard so that we don't drift away. Because when life isn't going as we had planned, it's, quite frankly, natural to withdraw. And that's the time when we actually need each other the most, the person who is discipling us. Maybe we should be leaning into the people that we serve with on our ministry team. The, if you're a student, being involved in the student ministry, instead of backing away, that's when you lean in. That's when you should invite, some, just invite someone that you know from the church over for dinner just to be together. Listen, there's a warning here for every disciple of Jesus. When you begin to disengage from what you know is right, you lower your standards and you excuse your behavior. Your prayers just become something you repeat. Or maybe you just don't even say them at all. Bible study gives way to exercise time. You're not as generous in your giving, and slowly you just kind of move away and disengage. And what we need to do, and maybe this is your next step in your faith, is to intentionally draw close to other believers that, by the way, is the difference between Judas and the other disciples. The other disciples went through times of disillusionment as well and confusion, but they stayed close. They drew closer to Jesus while Judas pulled away from Jesus and the others toward the enemy. And sometimes in, sometime in that process, you're going to come to a place where you have to make a choice. What do I do with these feelings that I have? How do I, how do I move forward with the way I feel? And we all know the choice that Judas made. But I want you to notice this was not a one-moment deal for Judas. His decision process went from talking to the religious leaders on Tuesday to actually betraying Jesus on Thursday. So there's three days there, and he had time then and before to think about this. There's a lot of time 
to give this consideration. He could have repented when Jesus prophesied his betrayal. He could have gone to the chief priest beforehand and said, here's your money back. I've changed my mind. But the kiss of betrayal most likely was the pivotal point. He'd crossed a line and there was no turning back. In Matthew 26, we read this. While he was still speaking, Judas, one of the 12, arrived. So they're in the garden now. And with him was a large crowd armed with swords and clubs sent from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now the betrayer had arranged a signal with them. The one I kiss is the man. Arrest him. And going at once to Jesus, Judas said, Greetings, Rabbi, and kissed him. And Jesus replied, Friend, do what you came to do. And then the men stepped forward. They seized Jesus and arrested him. Now while this is decision time, I want to make sure you don't miss this. This decision is a result of a series of smaller decisions that did not honor God. But that kiss was a line in the sand, right? The Bible tells us that Satan had already entered into Judas days before, but with that kiss, with that kiss, we see that Judas allowed Satan to take up residency inside of him. Can I just say that in our lives, we know when we're in process, we know when we come to that line in the sand, or the kiss. What is that kiss for you? When when have you crossed that line? For the alcoholic, it's the moment uh, that he opens the bottle. For the people involved in an affair, it's those words when you say, meet me at seven. For the divisive, it's when they choose to speak up and say words of criticism and sarcasm rather than holding their tongue. For the addict, it's going to that secret stash in the house that you think no one else knows about. Listen, the truth is, and this is going to be hard to hear, is we've, we've all sold out Jesus at times. All of us have. Maybe not in those ways, and maybe not to the degree that Judas did, but we all know what it's like to get to that line in the sand and then walk right across it. After the decision had been made and he's followed through. Judas continues the downward spiral as this decision that was supposed to bring relief and joy actually turns out to be in the wrong direction, and it leads to despair. So look at Matthew 27. In the first light of dawn, all the high priests and religious leaders met and put the finishing touches on their plot to kill Jesus. Then they tied him up and paraded him to Pilate, the governor. Judas, the one who betrayed him, realized that Jesus was doomed Overcome with remorse, he gave back the 30 silver coins to the high priest saying, I've sinned, I've betrayed an innocent man. And they said, what do we care? That's your problem. And Judas threw the silver coins into the temple and left. Listen, why do you think Judas tried to return that money? It tells us in verse 3, he was overcome with remorse, which by the way is a great first step. I mean, you've tried that, right? You realize that what you thought you were doing was right, but it turned out to be the wrong choice, so you tried to undo that choice. John MacArthur said it this way. He said, and it's in the notes, Judas' remorse was not the same as repentance. He was sorry not because he'd sinned against Christ, but because his sin did not satisfy him the way he had hoped. Paul talks about this in a letter to the Corinthian church. Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret. But worldly sorrow brings death. Judas went to the wrong place. (laughs) He allowed his guilt to send him back to the enemy camp seeking restitution rather than to God, looking for forgiveness. And it seems that Judas went from being disillusioned with Jesus to being disillusioned with himself. I'm curious how many of us have gotten there where we get up and look in the mirror and don't even really recognize ourselves anymore. And we've asked ourselves, how in the world did you get to this place? The tragedy is Judas Judas failed to repent. Listen, he, he still could have changed. He could have made it known to God, could have made it known to others. I blew it. I want to undo, right, this wrong so that the Messiah can be saved. And even though this betrayal led to Jesus' arrest, even if he had not done it, Jesus would have found a way to be crucified. It's why he came to earth. This whole crucifixion was not Judas' fault. Acts 2 makes it clear that Jesus died because of God's deliberate plan. This was part of a plan of God, his foreknowledge. But Judas could have come back to Jesus after the betrayal and asked for forgiveness But listen, when my disillusionment leads to or at least threatens to lead to separation from God, disciples of Jesus, what we do is we turn our hearts back to him and confess our sin and accept his forgiveness in our lives. That's not a momentary thing either. That's a process also. 
But Jesus' mercy knows no bounds, provided we ask for it, provided we really want to restore our relationship with God. Listen, don't let your weaknesses and your failure and sin and guilt alienate you from him. Rather, let them push you toward the Father for healing. Because it's important to see where this leads. His final stop was total destruction. It's the rest of verse 5 in Matthew 27. Judas threw the silver coins into the temple and left. And then he went out and hung himself. You know that's not uncommon today, right? On average, there are 130 suicides per day in our country. That's about one death for every 11 minutes. According to the CDC, in 2020, suicide was the third leading cause of death among 15 to 24-year-olds. We are the wealthiest and most blessed nation on earth in the history of the world. And when people figure out that the promises of this world do not satisfy, they become disillusioned with what they thought was most important. Jim Carrey, the actor, said, I think everybody should get rich and famous and do everything they ever dreamed of so they can see that it's not the answer. Disillusionment, if it's not dealt with, can lead to destruction. Listen, if you, if you want to, to listen to me, if you're on the brink of destruction, if you need help right now, your next step, the way you live on mission this week, you reach out for help. Let one of us here help you take the next step. And to be clear, listen, you don't have to take your life to be destroyed. In John chapter 10, Jesus says the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Sometimes he just guts people and leaves them alive. And they are a shell of who they used to be. And he will do that to you. That's why disciples of Jesus need to regularly recalibrate. When Jesus was talking to those who wanted to follow him, he made it very clear what the cost of discipleship is. He said, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. By the way, and we've talked about this before, I just want to remind those of you who already know this and make sure everyone here does know this, that a person, when they were being crucified, were considered dead not when they stopped breathing on the cross, not when they were nailed to the cross. They were considered dead when they picked up the cross and began to carry it. Jesus knew exactly what he was talking about and what he was saying to his followers. The moment we decide to follow Jesus, the moment we decide to pick up our cross, dead men walking, that's where the phrase comes from. We die to ourselves and we give our lives and loyalty to our king, to our savior, to our maker. You know, it's an ongoing commitment that we make every day that we remember every week when we come together for worship. Because our time of communion reminds us of the cross and Jesus' decision to give his life for our sins, but it also reminds us of our commitment to him through our baptism. And for those of you who have been thinking about that and have not made that commitment yet, we'd love to help you with that. But every time we remember what Jesus did, Every time we come to this moment in worship, we remember that we have committed to denying ourselves, taking up our cross daily, and following him. We remember that daily as individuals. We remember, we remember it weekly together to encourage each other and to remind each other you're not alone. And we are with you. And so I'm going to pray, and I'm going to give you a chance to talk to God about that. And then we'll remember together. Let's go to God. Father, thank you for a moment like this, not unlike Passover, where we take these emblems that Jesus remind us of your body and your blood, and they draw us back to a day 2,000 years ago on a hill outside of Jerusalem, where you willingly gave yourself up for our sins, where you allowed your body to hang on a cross, you allowed your blood to be spilled on our behalf. And so in part, we come to say thank you. But it's more than that. We come to relive that moment because those of us who are disciples of yours, Jesus, we come to recommit ourselves again. Our baptism said we wanted to make you Lord and Savior of our life. 
we make a decision every day as to whether we're going to pick up our cross and follow you again. And today we remember that together. And so we pray that you'll speak to us through these emblems, that they would draw us closer to you. Help us, we pray. Help us to be honest with you about where we are with things. Help us to be honest with you if we're doubting or if we're just discouraged or we're disappointed. It is in that confession that you begin the healing. And so we give this moment to you now as we talk to you about where we are. us of Jesus' body that was given for us, which adds weight to when he told his followers, if you want to follow me, you deny yourself, take up your cross every day. When he said that, the cross was not out of his mind. He knew exactly where he was headed and what he was about to do on our behalf. And so we remember together. reminds us of his blood which continues to call to us today to remind us of the walk and the life that we have been called to and that he helps us with and that we can be honest with him and so we remember Father may moments like these help us regardless of where we are in our walk with you for those who are trying to figure it out and don't even know if they really believe in you, may this help to see others who do. Father, for those who are questioning, who are doubting, who are struggling because of what's going on in, the life, in their life or the life of someone they love a great deal, Father, may this moment help pull them toward you. And Father, for those of us who follow you, may remembering take us back to that day to remind us that Jesus didn't call us to anything he was not willing and didn't do himself so that we might be steadfast in our faith and trust in you. Thank you for this reminder. And Jesus, we pray this in your name. Amen. Caught up in your presence I just want to sit here at your feet, caught up in this holy moment. I never want to leave. Oh, I'm not here for blessings. Jesus, you don't owe me anything more than anything that you can do I just want you and I'm sorry when I've just gone through the motions I'm sorry just sing another song take me back to where I started I open up my heart to you I'm sorry I'm sorry when I've come with my agenda I'm sorry I forgot that you're enough. Take me back to where we started. I opened up my heart to you. Let's sing that again. I'm caught up in your presence. I'm caught up in your presence. I just want to sit here at your feet. Caught up in this holy moment. 
Jesus, you don't owe me anything more than anything that you can do. I just want you. Sing, I just want you, nothing else. I just want you, nothing else. Nothing else, nothing else will do. I just want you. Nothing else, nothing else, nothing else will do. I just want you. And nothing else, and nothing else. of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already attained this, or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own, because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind, and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on for the goal, for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Nothing else, sing nothing else, nothing else.
God for a long time or maybe at all, but there's something in their hearts that's stirring them to come on Easter Sunday. And when he was talking about that, I thought about the story in Mark. It's a famous story you've probably heard, but it talks about where the paralyzed man and his friends were so anxious and so excited to know Jesus because they knew he could heal them, that they got to this house and it's overflowing with people, but they didn't let that stop them. They tore a roof down and they lowered him and Jesus rewarded them for their faith. And growing up, that story is a great story to know from that side. Like, man, I want a faith like that where I'm going to do, you know, nothing's going to get in my way to know who Jesus is. But over this year, I've kind of heard a different perspective of that story. And it's the people that are in that building, the people that are packing that house, the ones that are have known who Jesus is, they've heard that story, but they have their backs to the people who are trying to get in to hear it for the first time. So those people have to be desperate. And thankfully in that story, they were. But sometimes we know that could be the opposite. They could show up and say, well, I'm not welcome here. I gotta go find my next spot. So that's what my prayer for us this week to live on missions is that we're not having our back, you know, we're focusing our eyes on God. But we're not turning our back to the people behind us who wanna hear and need to hear that same message. Um, like I said, I know we love that passion. We love that people here. But if you've met our uh, facilities manager, Kelly, I don't want to be the one to tell him someone broke a hole in the roof to get down here to hear Mike's story. I don't want to be the one. You guys can do that. But but we want to make sure that we're just that welcoming community, that they come here and they know this is where I'm meant to be. This is where God has wants me here to hear his word and to grow to know him. So I'm going to pray for us, and then I'm going to ask that we continue living on that mission this week as we enter this holy week into Easter Sunday. Heavenly Father, we just, we thank you for um, this story. We thank you um, that in the Bible, we see the broken people like Judas. And we know that we can sit there and say, I'd never do that. But as Mike said, there's signs there. There's opportunities there. We can see it start to bleed in. And Lord, just we ask that when we have that feeling of instead of living like Jesus, we start to lean towards living like Judas, that you help us to, to see that. You make us aware of that and let us know, okay, I need I need to change. I need Jesus in my life, and I need to turn to those who are in my life around me. So we just thank you um, for this story. We thank you for the beginning of this Holy Week, Lord, um, and we just are so excited to celebrate what Easter means this week as we invite our friends, our families, our coworkers, everyone around us to come and know the good news of what Jesus did. Um, we thank you. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And all God's children said, amen. Have a great week, everybody.